So we've discussed what Newton's second law is. We've talked about what it means. Now let's talk about the process that we're going to use to solve problems using Newton's second law. So we're going to start where we normally start. We're going to draw a sketch. Often we'll do it in terms of drawing a sketch of both the initial and final state of the system. And then we'll use that the, those two sketches to draw the free body diagram. And one of the key questions that we need to ask ourselves is, does that free body diagram change? Because that may impact how we need to attack the problem. So if the free body diagram does change, it may mean a couple of things. One thing it may mean is that we have a problem that has several stages and we need to deal with each stage as if it were an independent problem and see how they connect as you sort of switch from one stage to the next. It may also mean, however, that we have a problem that we don't want to use Newton's second law to deal with at all. Right? It may be that, hey, the free body diagram is changing in such a way that we haven't built up the mathematical machinery to be able to solve the problem using Newton's second law when it changes like this. So we do want to pay attention to whether or not our free body diagram is changing. But once we have a free body diagram, we're going to pick a coordinate system. And the thing that we'll work on is paying attention to the direction of the acceleration. So in some sense, this step doesn't mean much, right? Your choice of coordinate system will, cannot determine what the right answer is. But it can determine how much work is required to get to the right answer. So the reason that we're going to want to pay attention to the direction of the acceleration in a Newton's second law problem is that it is almost always helping us figure out the preferred direction if we want to make the math easier in terms of solving for whatever it is that we're trying to solve for at the end of the problem. So picking a coordinate system can't dictate what the answer is, but it can dictate how much work we have to do to get there, which is why this becomes a pretty important step. Once we've picked a coordinate system, then we're going to break both our, all of our force vectors and the acceleration vector up into its components. We'll then use that to set up our Newton's second law equations. And again, like with any vector problem, we'll have one equation per relevant dimension. So if we have a one-dimensional problem where all the forces and accelerations line up along a single line, then we only have one equation. But if we have things that are, say, both horizontal and vertical within the problem, then we're going to need to set up two equations, one that tells us about stuff going on horizontally, let's say, the other that tells us about stuff going on vertically. Once we've set up our equation, then we'll come back and think about, okay, given the information I have in the problem, how can I deal with the magnitudes of some of these vectors? And so what we'll see is there are some equations that will help us figure out the magnitudes of a force if I'm given certain critical pieces of information. And so learning where we want to make those substitutions and where we can't make those substitutions is part of what we want to sort of get comfortable with in terms of working Newton's second law problems. And at that point, basically, we will have, we will have set up a system of equations that will have a certain number of unknowns, and now we just go solve. So um, we will often initially start by setting up Newton's second law problems where we have two equations with two unknowns. Again, what we'll see is, is as we add more complications, we're just adding more equations and more unknowns. All right, so this is the basic process that we're going to follow. Let's look at a couple of examples. So for starters, let's say I've got two horizontal forces that act on a 3.2 kilogram box as it speeds up while sliding to the right across a frictionless surface. Force 1 has a magnitude of 18 newtons, it points to the right. Force 2 has a magnitude of 14 newtons, it points to the left. What's the magnitude and direction of the acceleration of the box? So again, I'm going to start by drawing two pictures. One for initially what's going on, and my box is initially sliding to the right. There are the two forces acting on it. Force 1 points to the right, force 2 points to the left. I can draw my final picture. And again, the only difference really between my initial picture and my final picture, since these forces are constant, as, as the box slides is just that my velocity vector has grown larger because I know that my object is speeding up as it slides to the right. And that speeding up is really important information because we said what speeding up means is that the velocity and acceleration vectors have to point in the same direction. So since the velocity vectors point to the right and my object is speeding up, that tells me that the acceleration vector must also point to the right. 
So one thing I'm going to go ahead and highlight here. We're going to draw a free body diagram. That's a vector diagram. That vector diagram is going to contain the forces that act on the object. There are other relevant vectors that we probably want to keep track of in a Newton's second law problem. The most important of which is the acceleration, but it may also be useful in problems to keep track of the direction of the velocity. The pictures, the sketches we make, are a really good space to keep track of those kinematic vectors. Because if we make, if we put the velocities and accelerations into the free body diagram, that tends to make it more confusing than it needs to be and leads to mistakes. So what you're going to what you're going to see me do as I work through these problems is I'm going to put velocity and acceleration vectors in my sketches and leave the free body diagram to just have the forces. That's the way it's designed to be. Okay. So step one, I've got my couple of sketches. I've added in this additional information that I have about velocity and accelerations in terms of thinking about what's going on physically in the problem. Step two, draw the free body diagram. So again, I can do that by drawing a free body diagram from a single point because basically we're going to model this, this box as if it were a point mass. And so I can go through my questions in terms of thinking about the forces that act on it. So does the box have mass? Yes, it does. So there's going to be a gravitational force that pulls downward on the box. Is it in contact with the surface? Again, the answer is yes. So there's going to be a normal force that points up. I'm told the surface is frictionless. So therefore, I don't have to worry about a friction component. So just, just the normal that's going to point perpendicular to my horizontal surface. And since the box is sitting on top of the surface, the normal has to point up. Okay. There are no strings or cables or chains or anything else that's going to generate a tension within this problem. There are, however, two applied forces, right? So force one pushing the box to the right, force two pushing the box to the left. So here's my free body diagram. So there's four forces that act on the box in this particular example. So that's step one, two sketches. Step two, free body diagram. Step three, I want to pick a coordinate system. And again, we said we want to pay attention to the direction of the acceleration. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a coordinate system that lines up with the acceleration vector. So in this case, since the acceleration vector points to the right, I'm going to let positive x point to the right. Positive y then just needs to be perpendicular to that. And so in this case, I'll choose to let positive y point up. Since that's the coordinate system I want to use, I want to draw that coordinate system on top of my free body diagram as well. Because here are the five vectors, these four forces plus the acceleration, that I'm going to go ahead and break up into their components in the next step. So that next step says, okay, let's take those vector diagrams. And you'll notice that I've set up a table just like we've been using in working vector addition problems, because that's really what Newton's second law is, is it's a vector addition problem. And I've got the sum of the forces, so here are all my forces, equals mass times acceleration. So in setting up this table, again, I'm sort of using the double line here to sort of represent that equal sign in the equation. So when I break things up, I'm going to have a X component equation that's going to sit right here in this column, a Y component equation that's going to sit here in this column, and in both cases it's going to tell me add up all the forces that equals mass times the component of the acceleration. So let's start with the acceleration vector in terms of breaking things up into components. So I, by choice, right, I pick the coordinate system so that the acceleration vector points in the positive x direction, which means its y component has to be 0. Its x component is positive a, where a now means the entire magnitude of the acceleration. And then I just need to multiply that by the mass to be consistent with what's going on in my equation. In terms of breaking the forces up into their components, well, the normal force points in positive y. Force 1 points in positive x. The weight points in negative y force two points in negative x. So the nice thing here is because all of these force vectors lie along a coordinate axis, in each case, at least one or one of the components is zero. And I need to make sure that I've got the right sign on the other component. So what I've got now is I've broken my vectors up into components. So the next step 
that I want to do is use this table to set up my equations. So again, I can take the column on the left that's got all the x components to set up my x component equation. So the sum of the x component of the forces is equal to mass times x component of the acceleration. So that happens to be 0 plus F1 plus 0 minus F2 equals MA, where again I'm using F1 and F2 now to be the magnitudes of those forces, and A to be the magnitude of the acceleration. I can do the same thing with the column on the right. So I can set up my Y opponent equation. The sum of the Y components of the forces is equal to mass times Y component of the acceleration. So that's the normal plus zero minus the weight plus zero equals zero. So here again, I'm using Fn as the magnitude of the normal and Fg as the magnitude of the weight. And I've already taken care of the sign in terms of saying that the weight points down and the normal points up. At this point, so we've set up our equations. I want to think about magnitudes. And so here's the situation where if I'm told the weight of the box, then I just leave it as FG and that's what I'm going to plug in for the weight. But what I notice is the information that I'm given in this problem is I'm given the mass of the box. Now I know how to relate the mass to the weight. The weight is equal to mass times gravitational acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared. And so I'm going to go ahead and make that substitution. So there's not a substitution to make in my x equation. I'm just going to go ahead and eliminate the zeros. There is a substitution to make in my y equation. And so in this case, I plug in that the weight is equal to mg. And so now I've got two equations. Again, just before I start worrying about attacking things algebraically, let me make sure what my unknowns are so I can think about the best way to try and solve this system of equations. So I know I'm given the magnitude of force one, I'm given the magnitude of force two, I'm given the mass of my box, I know what the gravitational acceleration is. So when I look at these two equations, I should have two unknowns, and sure enough I do. The first one's the acceleration, the magnitude of the acceleration A. The other one happens to be the magnitude of the normal. Now in this particular problem, what I was asked for is the magnitude and direction of the acceleration of the box. Well, we've already said the direction of the acceleration points to the right. The magnitude of the acceleration is just A. It has its own equation, so I could just go ahead solve for a and be done in terms of answering the problem, right? So just solve this algebraically for a. I get f1 over, minus f2 over m, plug in my values, and I get 1.25 meters per second squared. In some sense, my second unknown in this particular problem, I don't need. But I could go ahead and solve for it, just in case I was also asked to solve for it. Or as we'll see, there may be times where I need that second unknown to answer for the first, the one that I am asked about. And so in this case, that's simple enough. I just get that the normal's equal to mass times the weight, or mass times gravitational acceleration. So that's 3.2 times 9.8, 31.4 Newtons. Okay. So here's one example. Let's look at a second example. So let's take the same box, but instead of ha having it pushed by a couple forces across a frictionless horizontal surface, let's pull it using a rope across a rough horizontal surface. So let's let the rope be angled at a, an angle of 30 degrees above the horizontal, and we'll say the tension in the rope happens to be 18 newtons. The box is initially at rest, and we're told that it accelerates to the right at a rate of 1.25 meters per second squared. What's the coefficient of kinetic friction between the box and the surface? So again, we're going to start in the same place. We're going to draw a couple of pictures. So initially, my box is at rest. It's being pulled on by that rope. That rope makes an angle theta with the horizontal. At the end, again, now my box is moving to the right as it slides across the surface. I still have that rope pulling up in the same direction, so it's still angled 30 degrees above the horizontal. Right, so my picture hasn't changed much, it's just that now I have a velocity vector that's non-zero, and that's happened because, again, the acceleration vector is pointing in the same direction as the velocity. My box accelerates to the right as it moves to the right, which is why it speeds up as it moves. Okay. So there's step one. Step two, draw my free body diagram. So again, I'm going to use my point particle model, draw it from a single point. Does the box have mass? Yes. So there's going to be a gravitational force that pulls down. Is it in contact with the surface? Yes. So I know I need a normal. 
The surface is horizontal and the box sits on top of it, so there's got to be a normal force that points up. In this case, is there friction? The answer is yes, because I'm told I got a rough horizontal surface. I know that the friction force is going to oppose the motion since the box is moving to the right. That tells me that friction has to point back to the left. So here's where drawing in that velocity vector is useful in making sure that I get the friction force pointing in the right direction. Are there any strings or ropes or cables or chains? In this case, sure enough, there is. So I want to draw in that tension force. And again, it's going to be uh, it's going to be at an angle of theta equals 30 degrees above the horizontal. And then are there any other applied forces pushing on the box? And in this case, the answer is no. So I've already got all the forces acting on the box included in my free body diagram. So now step three, I need to come back and pick a coordinate system. And again, we're going to make the same argument. This is that is I want to pick a coordinate system that lines up with the acceleration. I don't have to. It's simply useful in terms of minimizing uh, how much math I have to wade through to solve for the answer. So I'm again going to pick positive x pointing to the right in the direction of the acceleration. Positive y will point up. So I'm going to put that same coordinate system on top of the free body diagram. Step four, I need to break all five of these vectors, my four force vectors in the acceleration. I need to break them up into their components. So again, I'm going to set up my table. My table is again going to be set up with the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. So again, I'm just using that double line to, to try and be as clear as I can about the equation that I'm going to set up. And I'll start with the acceleration vector first. And again, I've picked the coordinate system so that one of the acceleration components is zero. In this case, it happens to be the y component. And the other component is positive and the entire magnitude of the acceleration. So that's why there's not a subscript on that a anymore, is because it is the entire magnitude of the acceleration. And it points in the positive direction. I've multiplied it by m because I know I'm going to need that for my equation. For the force vectors, breaking them up, them up into components. Well, again, with the tension, again, it doesn't lie along an, a coordinate axis. So I know that I need to think about two non-zero components. The x component is going to be positive. The y component is going to be positive. I'm going to have that magnitude of the tension force in both. And since the angle theta is an angle with the horizontal, cosine theta is going to go with my x component. Sine theta is going to go with my y. The normal points in positive y, so the x component will be zero, the y component will be positive. Kinetic friction points in negative x, so the y component zero and the x component is negative. And then the weight points in negative y, so the x component is zero and the y component is negative. So again, I've set up my uh, set up my table here, breaking my all five vectors that I need, the four force vectors and the one acceleration vector, up into their components. So next step is to go ahead and set up my equation. So again, I can set up the x equation using my column on the, on the left. And so I get the, the sum of the x components of the forces equals mass times x component of the acceleration. So in this case, that's Ft cosine theta plus 0 minus F sub k plus 0 equals ma, where again, the, the F sub K now is just the magnitude of the friction force because I've already taken care of the sign correctly. I can set up my Y equation by doing the same thing just for the Y components using the column on the right. So the sum of the Y components of the forces equals mass times Y component of the acceleration. So again, I've got FT sine theta plus the normal plus zero minus the weight equals zero, where again, that FG is now just the magnitude of the object's weight. As we did before, once I got my equation set up, I want to come back and think about, are there any substitutions I can make? And in this case, there actually happen to be two. So the first one's the one that's on the bottom. So again, since I'm given the mass of the box, not the weight, I can plug in mg for the magnitude of the gravitational force and, so, and take advantage of the fact that I know the mass. And the other thing is, I'm asked to solve for the coefficient of kinetic friction. Well, that's mu sub k, which means that I probably want to make the substitution that the force of kinetic friction is equal to mu sub k times the normal. And so those are the two substitutions I'm going to make. So in this case, notice I've got a substitution in my x equation. So that now becomes Ft cosine theta minus mu sub k times the normal equals ma. 
and I've got a substitution in my y equation. So f, f sub t sine theta plus the normal plus 0 minus mg equals 0. And so now I'm just going to take those two equations and solve. And again, what I notice is that the equation, or before I start solving, let me think about what are my unknowns. I've got two equations, which means I can't have any more than two unknowns, and I want to see where they are so I can figure out the best way to attack the problem going forward. So I'm told what the value of the tension is. I'm told what my angle theta is. I'm told the mass of the object, and I'm told its rate of acceleration, and I'm told, and I know what the gravitational acceleration is. So in this case, I still have two unknowns. One of them is mu sub k, which I'm asked for. The other is the normal force, which I'm not. And so part of what I recognize when I look at, at the way these equations are laid out is that I have two unknowns in one equation, but only one unknown in another, which means the easiest way to attack this is basically to go ahead and solve for the normal. And so in this case, I get the normals equal to mg minus ft sine theta. I know what all those values are, so I can plug in, solve for that as a number. It happens to be 22.4 newtons. And now I can go solve, use my second equation to solve for mu sub k. So in this case, it takes a little bit of algebra to get that mu sub k is equal to ft cosine theta minus ma over the normal. And I know what all those, what the values are for all of those, those, those expressions. So a tension of 18 newtons, cosine of 30 degrees, minus 3.2 times 1.25 for the acceleration, divided by 22.4 for the normal. And I get that mu sub k is equal to 0 0.5.